Now, gunmen have killed at least seven people at a Rohingya refugee camp in Bangladesh. The attack happened in the early hours of Friday morning at a religious school in Cox's Bazaar. One person has been arrested. Last month, a Rohingya leader, Mohibullah, was shot dead in that camp. The government had pledged to step up security. These miscreants are members of the Arakan Rohingya Salvations Army. They're living in these camps. Now the situation is we have to support them. Either we'll have to join forces with them or we'll have to leave the camps. Tanvi Chowdhury has the latest now from Dhaka. We can confirm that seven people were shot dead and their names have been published. And we know at least a dozen people were seriously injured. One person, as you mentioned in your report, that has been detained. We don't know if he was directly involved. They did find a weapon with him. Now, there was a reaction from the foreign minister of Bangladesh. He said that the security forces, if needed, should use live bullet in order to uh, stop what he calls uh, a rampant drug and arms trade at the camp. Uh, this came just a few hours ago from the foreign minister. The situation is quite alarming in the camp. Uh, since uh, Mr. Mohibullah's killing in the beginning of this month, uh, the security forces are still doing an operation inside the camp. As we spoke to our contacts within the camp, they said that most of the Rohingyas are staying inside their home because they're fearful. Many people might be detained. We were in the camp uh, beginning of this month when Mr. Mohibullah was killed, talking to various community leaders and the Rohingya people that we know over the years. They said they're scared actually now because there are a lot of internal feud between at least three se separate organizations, uh, sort of like a turf war for power. Aside from this, there are gang warfare. Those involve a small fraction of the communities involved in drug trafficking from Myanmar. Also, they're involved in arms trafficking. Even those fire incidents last year, uh, they said they were actually not just uh, accidental. They were deliberately set up out of you know, a rift between different groups. Well, let's now bring in Ronan Lee in London. He's the author of Myanmar's Rohingya Genocide and a visiting scholar with Queen Mary University of London's State, State Crime Initiative. Uh, Ronan, this is a community that's already been faced with so much violence across the border, and now this inside the camps. What's actually driving the spate of killings we're seeing? Well, this is the last thing that the Rohingya community needs to see happening. Uh, what I think we're seeing is that uh, groups that were previously uh, militant political groups, like the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, have morphed or been taken over by organised crime gangs. Uh, and we're seeing this throughout uh, the frontiers, Myanmar's frontiers with every country, uh, that there's a rise of organised crime since the coup in Myanmar. We're seeing it in Thailand, we're seeing it on the border in India, and we're seeing it now, unfortunately, in the Rohingya communities uh, along the Bangladesh-Myanmar frontier. And it's unfortunate for the Rohingya that they happen to be resident on the on the border. And that's, I think, making things worse for them. But it's, it's bad, bad news for the Rohingya. It's not a situation that is in their interests. Uh, the the Rohingya community do not want to be seen in Bangladesh uh, as a lawless group that are bringing conflict to Bangladesh. And it's not the view of the majority of the Rohingya community. I mean, most Rohingya are, are moderate people who want to have access to their human rights and to look after their families and have and educate their children. But they've been, uh, they've been pressured in many instances, as we're seeing. And I think what we saw today was payback to people who had been in communication with the authorities talking about criminality of other groups and they were been punished by those group by that group today. Mm. Uh, Ronan, you mentioned involvement from the Myanmar side. Is this then being almost indirectly sanctioned by the Myanmar military? Can you talk us through the calculations for them? I think it's the logical consequence of what we've seen since the coup in Myanmar. Uh, the Myanmar military is not either is not capable or is not willing to curtail the drugs trade along its borders, either with Thailand or with India or with Bangladesh. And what we're seeing in in uh, what we're seeing in Bangladesh is that uh, organised crime is more than happy to use Rohingya because they're they're people living on the border uh, as uh, as pawns in 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 in, in, in their 
game. We're seeing it also in India. We're seeing it also in, in Thailand, remember. This is not something that's unique to the Rohingya community. It's a tragedy today for the Rohingya community. And, and the Rohingya community, because of their vulnerable position, will, I mean, they're victims of genocide. They're, they're people who will feel the consequences of this uh, very, very harshly. They're in a very vulnerable position within Bangladesh, and they do not need... Uh, they do not need criminals uh, using them for their own ends. Of course. Well, this was an attack on a seminary, and with Mohibullah's death three weeks ago, it seems that these tactics to attempt to instill fear, they are working? Yes, they, they, well, they, they will work. And, and uh, it's, it's a playbook that the Arakan uh, Rohingya Salvation Army has used before. It, it's used it within northern Myanmar when they wanted to, uh, when they wanted to eliminate moderate opposition to, uh, to work that they were doing there and their attempt to, their attempt to launch what, what they would call as, a, a, what they were calling an insurgency, is that they targeted, they targeted moderates with uh, appalling violence. Mm -hmm. And it, it just leads other moderate leaders is not to be willing or, or to be, frankly, fearful of the consequences of speaking out. I mean, the message really for the Rohingya community has to be to try and avoid uh, avoid engagement with these groups as much as they can. But it's e easier said than done in a camp situation where, sure, during the day, the Bangladesh authorities have some sense of, of uh, control and policing. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's, there's real concerns about what happens at night. Well, if this is all then deriving from these powerful organised crime groups, what can actually be done? I, I see there are now attempts to build more fences, perhaps relocate more people to this desolate island. Will any of that make any difference? Uh, it, it'll have some difference, but ultimately the long-term the long-term solution for the Rohingya, I think, uh, and it is a long-term solution, will will have to involve uh, being able to return to Myanmar at some point in the future. But until then, they have, I think, now an incredibly hard road ahead of them, if if that is even imaginable. I think the next step for moderate leaders of the Rohingya community is to reach out to Myanmar's alternate government, the National Unity Government, and and hope that they can be able to be a part of a, a better future in a post-military or post-coup Myanmar. But in the short term, I think there's, there's some tough days ahead for the Rohingya community in Bangladesh. This is, this is today very, very bad news. Ronan Lee there, the author of Myanmar's Rohingya Genocide, speaking to us from London. Great to get your thoughts and expertise with us on Al Jazeera. Thank you for joining us, Ronan. Pleasure.